Hi everyone. Today I'm looking at free overpowered community builds that I've come across to show you how to set them up, where to find everything you'll need to make these builds, find out just how powerful they really are and if there's any downsides to them that weren't mentioned. I've linked the creators who shared these builds in the description so definitely go check them out. But where they just drop the basic method into a short, I'm going to give you a clear and concise walkthrough on what they have suggested. First, the Creator Player 5 shared an electrifying Storm Sorcerer build in a short, and I wanted to see just how powerful it can really get in Act 1. In the video, he goes with a high half elf. I would have probably picked a blue or bronze Dragonborn due to its close link with Lightning, but since race proficiency doesn't make a difference in this build, it doesn't matter what you choose. We do need to select the class Storm Sorcerer, and I copied the cantrips and spells that are listed on the screen. This class comes with Tempestuous Magic, a passive feature of the Stormy Sorcerer. It gives you the ability to disengage from a fight by granting you the spell Fly as a bonus action after you use any level spell, without receiving opportunity attacks against you. This is the reason Feather Falling was selected. You will want to take a ritual spell such as Feather Falling, Disguise Self, Enhance Sleep or Expeditious Retreat to unlock your Tempestuous Magic without using up a spell slot. This will also enable you to use Fly any time outside of combat for free. Though it's not shown, the skills give away that he used Sage as a background. He went on to tell us to set it up with the stats Strength 8, Dexterity 14, Constitution 16, Intelligence 8, Wisdom 10 and Charisma 17. So that's just what I did. You'll want to select the Meta Magic, Twin Spell, Careful Spell and Quicken Spell at levels 2 and 3 to enhance your attack based spells. Get to level 4 and become a dual wielder. This is important so you can use all the gear needed. That's the setup for the character. So let's look at the gear, but I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to help you locate each part. The main handed weapon is the Spell Sparkler, a rare quarter staff that allows the wielder to generate lightning charges upon dealing damage with spells. This is rewarded for rescuing Councillor Floric from the burning in of Joaquin's Rest during the quest Rescue the Grand Duke. This is one of the three possible rewards from this quest. The next weapon is for your offhand, and it's why you need dual wheeling, the Staff of Arcane Blessing. This staff has the spell Bless, and the passive feature called Mistra's Blessing, which when active gains an extra 2d4 to spell attack rolls. It is found leaning up against the table in the basement of the Arcane Tower. To reach the basement, the player must either convince Bernard on the top floor to leave Gilding Light on a table, or defeat Bernard and take it. The ring can be used to activate a secret button on the tower's teleporter pad to reach the basement. The Sparks Wall is an uncommon ring that shields the wearer from lightning, which is very important as it protects you from accidentally damaging yourself. It can also be found in the Arcane Tower's basement in a gilded chest. Necklace of Elemental Augmentation is an uncommon amulet which has elemental augmentation that adds the spell casting modifier to the damage when the wearer uses elemental damage such as lightning with a cantrip. It is inside a display case in the Inquisitor's Chamber at Kreshelik. Or another place it can be found is inside the Traveller's Chest on the shipwreck ship northwest of the South Span checkpoint in Worms Crossing. Gloves of the Belligerent Skies are an uncommon pair of gloves that inflict reverberation when the wearer deals thunder, radiant or lightning damage. They are inside the Elegant Chest in the Inquisitor's Chamber of Kreshelik along the southern wall of the room on the western side. The Boots of Stormy Clamour are an uncommon pair of boots that also inflicts the reverberation condition on creatures when afflicting it with another condition. They are sold by Omulum in the Ebon Lake Grotto after completing Help Omulum Investigate the Parasite. The Protecti Sparks Wall is a rare item of clothing that buffs the wearer's defence while they have lightning charges. It can be looted from the gilded chest at the end of the trap bridge in Grimforge. The Lightbringer is an uncommon circlet that grants the wearer temporary hit points whenever they gain lightning charges. It is sold by Bulge in the Myconic well, Colony. If anything... Now to test it, I need to group the enemies with Minor Illusion, get them wet, then use Lightning Bolt, Twin Shocking Orb or Shocking Grasp to hit multiple enemies with advantage and build up large amounts of lightning charges while leaving reverberating attacks on them all. So my observations from using this build is that it's not super overpowered like some of the other builds. 
but it is a great addition to a strong party. Once you've got control over placing the water and setting up for these style of fights, you can land a lot of damage in a short time for a sorcerer that's still in Act 1. There is a slight downside that although your sorcerer is safe from being electrocuted, your party is still vulnerable and characters that are based around close combat will need to be prepared with lightning resistance or they'll need to wait at the sidelines. The next creator is GM Workshop and his build suggests that you can get Karlak to deal 50 plus attacks in a single turn. This is possible using the spell Death Ward. It is a level 4 cleric spell that protects a creature from death. The next time damage would reduce you to 0 hit points, you remain conscious with 1 hit point left. What it doesn't say in its description is that after someone gets down to 0 and brought back to 1 HP, they have all their action points back. Karlak needs to be at least level 12. Use Haste Scroll, a Blood Elixir, an Action Surge for a total of 10 attacks. Cast Death Ward on her before the fight, and after using your action points, either have a party member knock her down, or use a weapon like Nyrulna with an AoE to down herself on the last attack. She will get up again with only 1 HP, but since it's still her turn and all her actions are back, you can just carry on smacking the enemies around. Each party member can cast the Death Ward on her after she stands back up, and you can easily get up to 50 attacks. Another way to increase the attacks is to use the legendary weapon Duelist Prerogative, a highly enchanted special variant of the Rapier's family of weapons. As a finesse weapon, it can benefit from the wielder's dexterity and not just their strength. Among a bunch of other features, this weapon comes with Dueler's Enthusiasm, while you are not dual wielding, you can make an additional melee attack with this weapon. It is a reward for completing the quest Save Vanra. This build does exactly what it says it will do, though I could only manage to get 9 attacks before having to use Death Ward to refresh the actions. A large amount of focus goes on to Karlak, with having party members use their actions to down her or recast Death Ward on her. If you class the whole of your party to have Death Ward to use on Karlak, you can definitely surpass 50 attacks, but you sacrifice the utility of a mixed party. I believe this build works well more for tactical use than smashing large amounts of damage onto some of the enemies. By applying specific effects individually to multiple enemies, you can target weaknesses using maneuvers, coatings, arrows and bombs. Also, when downed, all the movement points are regained. Paired with haste, you can make a loop around a large battlefield to get effects on all the enemies you want in the very first round. Toy House has put out a load of really good builds and other tips. The one I'm most interested in is the endless attacks while permanently staying invisible. To do this, you'll need to increase your stealth skill past the point where stealth checks can discover you when you do your hidden attacks. First, you'll want to pick a race that has an extra boost in stealth, such as a Lightfoot Halfling, which grants you naturally stealthy, or a Trickery Domain Cleric, who has the class action Blessing of the Trickster. Then, by combining everything you can that will help push up the stealth skill, such as a high dexterity modifier, having advantage on stealth checks, skill proficiency, skill expertise, and having spells active like Pass Without Trace, which gives a plus 10 bonus on stealth checks you'll be able to reach the limit where most enemies won't ever know you were there, even as you jab them with your sword. Some of the way you can increase your dexterity and stealth skill checks is through gear. The Graceful Cloth Armor, which has Cat's Grace, that increases your dexterity by 2 to a maximum of 20. And also, Nimble as a Cat, that gains you a plus 1 bonus to your dexterity saving throws. This is sold by Lady Esther at the Rosemorn Monastery Trail, just after taking the mountain path. Smuggler's Ring is an uncommon ring that grants the wearer bonus stealth and sleight of hand found by looting a skeleton hidden in a bush on the lower path following the river near the broken bridge section of a risen road. Assassin's Short Sword is an uncommon short sword that grants the wielder advantage on stealth checks found on one of the pair of skeletons along the cliffs west of the House of Healing. Guidance should be cast by a spellcaster to grant the temporary bonus to creatures ability checks, which includes stealth. Then have a wizard cast the level 4 spell Greater Invisibility on you and you're good to go. Switch to turn based mode. This is truly an overpowered build. Once the Greater Invisibility is applied, you can actually assassinate rooms full of people. 
Without modifications, at level 12, Gale is able to cast Greater Invisibility 12 times before a long rest. Three casts using the level 4 spell slots, two at level 5 and one at level 6, with Arcane Recovery to replenish the level 4 spell slots up to 6 times. The main issue with this build is damage output. Without some clever adjustments, this will not be the best plan of attack against extremely strong enemies, but it does work great to clear out a room of weaker enemies without the power of the horde causing a lot of damage to your party. So this will be my third member of my party, but what should I do for the fourth? I want to hear what are the best builds that you have heard of or made yourselves, so jump in the comments and tell me the strongest builds in Baldur's Gate 3. And don't forget to hit the sub button to come back.